Hello. Uh, welcome to another heavy committing talk. Um, I, I think I need to explain a little bit what the heavy committing means. So um, one day on a mailing list or in IRC, I, I don't recall where it was, Uber came uh, along and did this huge commit, right? And we got like 50 commit mails. And then I was like, Uber, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, ah, well, I'm on heavy committing. And since then, everybody uses this word, right? Um, so, so we decided to have um, two talks, one after another. When we talk about Lucene internals, I'm um, going to call it heavy committing. That's, that's the story behind it. Um, I'm going to talk about a feature which has not been committed to trunk yet. It's um, still developed in a branch. Um, it's called doc values. The feature is called doc values. There's also a class in Lucene which uh, exists since you know, 2.4. Um, which is called doc values. Don't confuse it with it. It's got similar context, similar um, semantics, but it's it's something different. Um, for some for some of you, maybe the name column stripe fields make more sense, but let's see. I'll explain how it works. All right. Um, well, I first talk about the um, actual problem, um, and then um, give you um, a little bit of an insight what how how people solve this problem today or how people work around the problem, and eventually we're going to look at the implementation, and there's some small micro benchmarks. Um, yeah. Okay, go. So, how many of you use Lucene? Good, good, okay. So you probably know what a reverse index is, right? Take some documents, and you index them, and you have a, somehow you can imagine a reverse index as just a sort of list of unique terms. And each unique term has some metadata, like uh, the frequency of the term and uh, the document IDs where the term occurs in. In Lucene, this is actually um, mapped to a terms enum. This is Lucene 4. Um, it, I don't re even recall what it's in Lucene 3. It's like terms? Term enum. Top? Or, yeah, okay. That's plural. Okay. Um, yeah, you put an index writer and it just magically makes this reverse index out of it. And um, you take it and fire a query on it. Simple and query, right? You, you get all the documents where those two terms occur in. Two terms, two posting lists, all the document IDs. You, throw, you, you iterate over them, build a score from it, get it back, and you have an ordered list of uh, documents ordered by the relevance. So, but a lot of people um, tend to do some kind of things like function queries in Solar. Right, how many people use Solar and use function queries? A couple. Oh, Chris, thank you. Um, so let me quickly explain what a function query is. A function query is uh, basically um, a, some kind of a function which returns a float value. And that float value is incorporated into the score. Right? So for instance, you have, um, you have a web search and you want to do page rank. What you do is um, you calculate your page rank for each for each document, you put the page rank in a field, um, and eventually when you score a document, you can incorporate that value into a score. Like pages which are more relevant should go, should go up, right? Um, you can use it as a tiebreaker and things like that. There's also click feedback. Um, I know there's a couple of Nokia guys, they want to incorporate click feedback in the back, right? David. Hi. <laughs> He's not, he's not listening at all. I was just making sure he's listening. Okay, so there's two possibilities right now um, to do this. One is a stored field. Um, one is uh, you put it in the inverted index. The problem is that um, the inverted index is not a document to value mapping, it's a value well, string to document mapping. Right? Um, but at, at search time, the query time, you need these values. Um, you get the document ID and you do value for it. So the only way to do this in the scene directly is a stored field. Well, um, let's see how stored fields work. Um, stored fields have been built for um, getting data out of the Lucene index to like render the top 20, <coughs> right, or render the top 20. And um, that's, it's not been built for getting um, values from a stored field for, let's say, 10 million documents you score in an org query. 
right? It would be, actually when you look at the implementation, um, it does at least one seek, right? There's a, uh, a lookup table, which is a fixed length um, long value in the FDX uh, file, and what, it, what you do when, when you look up a document's value from a stored field, you first go and get the pointer into the data file, and then you scan to the actual field until you get the value, right? If you do that for every document in a uh, Boolean query with 10 million, 10 million documents, well, you get 10 million seeks. Um, Doc was saying something like five milliseconds. It's like easy back of the end, well, math, that, that's not gonna fly. There are alternatives. Um, how many people have heard about field cache? A couple, okay. So, um, field cache is an uh, uninverted view of the index, right? You can actually uh, just imagine you have a big array, and for each document ID, there's a value in this array. In this case, it's, I just call it weight, and um, the, the index of the value corresponds to the document ID. Document IDs are zero based. So the, the value at index zero is the, doc, is the value which corresponds to the value, to the document here. Document zero, value 5.8. So until the scene three, all the values in the term the index were strings, right? So those strings needed to be parsed when you load your field cache. What happens once you load the field cache is the scene goes and goes from the top of the term dictionary down to the bottom, gets all the unique terms, parses them, looks up the document, and checks um, where the value needs to go. So in the worst case, you, I don't know, if you have a 100, 100 million documents index, um, it, it needs to go through all the values for all the documents, needs to parse them, look the documents up, put it in an array, right? The most expensive part here is actually not traversing this, it's the parsing, right? Parsing a floating point value from a string is very expensive. Um, there are better ways in the meanwhile with uh, numeric fields, um, but it always depends on what you do with your values, right? So that's what I said. It, in the worst case, you have a string field, you parse it with um, floats, parse string, and um, that's going to take a long time. It works well for a lot of people, but um, it's not a natural way to do it. So, um, Field cache is super fast. It's just really constant time look up. You look up in a value in an array, um, but it can take a long time to load. Um, once it's in memory, it's perfectly fast, right? Um, but the going through the term dictionary and maintaining all the term dictionary has an impact on your search. Since the term dictionary is not only um, the source for this, it might be used for searching, it's also used for merging, right? You need to merge segments, term dictionaries together. That means each time you uh, merge a segment, you re-index documents, you update documents. After that, some kind of merge will happen, and it'll take all these terms, uh, take them into memory, um, maybe resort them, depending on if you have an old index using with Lucene 4, um, writing it down to disk again, right? And there's, there are always strings. Um, well, there's bytes now in Lucene 4, um, as it was said. But um, it always takes processing of those values, right? There's no way to be type safe there. There's no way to really specify, okay, I have certain kind of compression or anything like that. A loading um, field cache for one field <coughs> in a 10 million documents index takes about three seconds, right? But this is one field. And I know at least one person in this room who has um, an unlimited amount of field cache. Um, fields, basically. So there could be 100, there could be 150. Um, if there's a lot of documents, that's going to take a long time. Do you have numbers on how long it takes to open the index, loading a field cache? No, not, not a hand. Okay. So, um, well, you can, you can just uh, multiply this by, by 10, and then it's roughly um, like 30 seconds to open a doc, uh, an index with uh, 100 million documents. And it's not unusual to have that many documents, depending on the use case. Field cache is another problem. It loads everything to memory, right? If you don't have enough memory, like um, I've been working on uh, Lucene implementations on Android mobile phones, you cannot afford a field cache there. 
I tell you, you get two megabytes of heap space, field cache will just kill you. Um, so there, there's some, somehow a need for some more native data structure for uh, doing this kind of things. So to wrap up before I go to the more native solution, well, um, field cache is some kind of abusing the index, right? It's some kind of workaround. It worked well for a long time, um, but this, the actual solution of Darkwell has just been around for a long time too. Um, people wanted that, um, and we eventually implemented it. So let's see how the more native approach works. So column stride fields are a, uh, a dense data store, which means each document has a value, right? Um, you can specify default values for your documents if you don't, if, if there are documents that have, no, don't have any. Um, with field cache, there is a slightly different way of doing it. This is what you see when you do sorting in Solar and you've seen when you specify sort missing last, right? Or sort missing first, then uh, we see now is okay, if there's, a, um, if, if there's no value in the field cache array for this document, it puts you at the end of the, of the sort, or it puts you at the beginning of the sort. This doesn't work with doc values, you have to specify it yourself. Um, it, um, it, are, it supports these three data types, a byte array, uh, floats doubles, and 64-bit signed integers, um, but they're all native. It means you don't have to specify a string, you put in the value directly. <coughs> For all the numeric data types, the default value, if you don't specify one, or if there's um, a segment which hasn't got this field at all, it'll always be zero. So default values or missing values in um, doc values are consistent over all types. It's also for bytes. If you don't specify a byte value, it's always be an empty byte array. But you'll never get null or anything like that. Oh yeah, and it's entirely optional. So and you don't have to have this with Lucid 4 if you don't need it. You don't need it. You can view the whole thing as a simple spreadsheet. It's no rocket science here, um, but you'll see it's, it's useful in, um, in, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, so basically, it's, just, it's, it's like an array persisted to disk. There's a little bit more about it, but um, it's basically, you can, you can say you have a field time and just put all your times in, right? And they're gonna be like super large longs, right? You might, you might need all the 64 bits. But the good thing is the implementation is a little bit smarter. So it'll only encode the ranges that you really use, right? So if you, if you start, um, he, if, well, we'll look at it on the next slide. So it doesn't really encode the entire number, it only codes deltas and ranges. Um, you can also have like a field ID which you want to search. If you, if you want to update your documents or want to delete your documents, you need to be searchable, right? You need to do term lookup. And for that sake, you can have a doc values field ID and also say, okay, this should be searchable. And then you see we'll do the rest in the background. Um, yeah, this is just an example of um, the data type, so nothing, nothing fancy in that regard. Um, for the integer case, it actually uses a compressed integer set. Um, it's um, an implementation called packed ints. If somebody knows about patched frame of reference or frame of reference integer codings, it, um, it is pretty simple to that, just it uses one frame. So patch frame of reference works like um, you encode like 64 bit, uh, 64 integers and it'll, it'll look like at the, at the range you're encoding and then adjust the bits, for the, uh, how many bits you need. That, um, but in, in our case, we don't need to decode entire blocks, we just read one after another and there's a fixed range of integers you can encode in there. It has one downside, it doesn't support negative values. If, you, if your range doesn't fit in a positive, in, in two by the power of 63 um, bits, it'll automatically fall back to an entire range of integers, 64 bit, and it writes them straight to disk. On the byte side, we have a, a couple of variations, so you're not um, bound to anything. Um, all those variations you see here, they are combinable. So we have a fixed straight byte implementation, which always encodes a fixed number of bytes 
and writes them one after another on disk. Um, that's actually a very efficient way of doing it because since you know how long the, the bytes are, you know where to seek to, to read them. Um, we also have variable length. They have uh, certain limitations. There are people planning to build skip, skip lists in to have uh, faster access on disk. Um, it's also um, straight, straight or referenced. The reference means, you see it over there, is there's an um, offset pointer kept around. If you have a lot of values that are, um, a lot of documents have in common, you should probably use that one. That's, um, that's the faster or the, the, the more compact representation of it. But if you have like a fixed rate, um, fixed number of bytes and every document has probably different value, you could just put it one after another. The difference here is that um, you can basically encode whatever you want here in this byte array, right? And you can make it um, as efficient as possible when you, want, when you get it back. You can um, maybe put an entire struct in there. So it's, well, you see you probably just cast the, byte, the, the memory address into a struct and then get the values from it. What are the variants? The uh, difference to field cache is that um, we also have sequential di on disk access, so you're not forced to load it into memory, but you can if you want. It's all up to you. It's actually also up to you if you want to add a different implementation, a different compression scheme or anything like that. But the, um, the variant on disk only has sequential access. For uh, the RAM resident stuff, you always get random access. It's pretty similar to the array. You just, you just call a method and pass in the, um, the document ID. Right. We are planning to have um, get array methods where you can convert your documents while you API straight to into an array and then use it just as field cache. I actually hope that we eventually get rid of field cache and replace it with um, doc values entirely. But um, I think that'll take a little time to make it, you know, there's a lot of people concerned about performance and um, the JIT compilers do tricky things if you have multiple implementations um, of a class, so it's not always as fast in as, as in the benchmarks. How does this work? Um, well, as any other Lucene API, you have to specify a field when you want to index it. Um, there's an index doc values field. Um, it used to be called doc values field, but that was so confusing with the actual doc values class we have in the function query package. So when we switch to index doc values here as the name, um, the feature still is called doc values. <clears throat> here in this, um, in this scenario here, you don't have anything um, searchable, right? It just indexes the doc values. In the example down here, it, it passes a, a doc values field into a field um, just by calling set, a field set doc values and then it'll index um, in the field title, the title text that's uh, not stored but analyzed. Just as any um, other missing field so far. I don't want to show you too much code, I just want to give you an example of how, how this looks like. Um, from the API point of view, reading the values, <coughs> excuse me, um, you you have um, the sequential access on top. It's a values enum. What you have to know ahead of time is that your page rank field is a float value, right? If you if you call a float a float enum dot get int, you'll get an exception. Okay. Um, float ref. Uwe, have you been talking about bytes ref? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So a uh, float ref is also something like like a bytes ref. It just includes floats, right? It has an array. It has an offset and a length. And um, we use these kind of um, structs here, these kind of pointers, um, to prevent another method call. <clears throat> but what you do here is it, it looks extremely similar to a scorer or any other like a filter in Lucene. It's also doc ID set iterator, and it just use it in the same way. You just call floating on next document and compare if it's not um, no more docs, right? Int max no more docs. Um, assigning the document and you know document ID and get the floats value. That's actually not a very good practice because it could have a different offset. So you should call ref ref dot floats um, ref dot offset, and then that'll get you the right value. 
Um, the, currently, there's no implementation who has more than one value. Um, but if you want to write your own, there's a possibility to do that, to pass more than one. This is more or less equivalent to um, just using advanced. That's the nice thing about it. It can also skip over a lot of documents that you don't need. It doesn't read all those in. This is basically the sequential access, um, which is, might be used, mostly used when you go on disk. But it's also exposed by the in-memory implementation. So if you, if you, if you request a, a values enum and the doc ID, uh, the, doc, uh, the index doc values know that you already loaded that in memory, it'll just give you a iterator over the in-memory array. So it will be smart about this. RAM resident API, um, pretty straightforward. You just call source, got float for the document ID you want to have, and you get it back. And this is what I was saying. You can also explicitly get a, um, a values enum from a source, then it won't go on disk, but it just iterates over the internal representation of the source. Um, well, can I add my own doc values implementation? Yes. It's um, entirely exposed through the codec API we were talking about, flexible indexing API. Um, if you want to roll out your own, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can probably do it in like uh, 30, 40 lines of code, extending it. It might be not super good if you do nothing, nothing fancy, but um, if something fits your use case, right, you can still roll your own. I consider this an expert feature, so is there anybody in the room who thinks you would do that? Chris, <laughs> Shay, yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it, you, can, you can like put in um, custom compression techniques where you know ahead of time that you won't have more than n values or something like that. You can put your own and say, okay, I wanna have minus one as a default value. It, it won't be a big deal. I probably can skip that um, since Uwe was talking about it, but for, for those who haven't been here, um, the Flex API is a layer underneath Index Writer and Index Reader. What we had before in the scene three was the directory. Codec and Flex API didn't exist. Uh, file system underneath directory, you can, it simply, it simply simplified, it's a uh, I.O., it's a stream factory. It creates a stream for the underlying file systems. And uh, before that, the index reader was reading from the directory and the index reader writing to the directory. What you now can do is you can use the Flex API and define how the values coming from the index writer are encoded, how laid out on disk. You can basically do, you know, if you, if you wanna, if you wanna build a B tree instead of a finite statement structure or you wanna go back to do the old fashioned scene binary search um, term dictionary, you can, you can do it. Right. It's, this is an absolute expert feature, um, and if you, if you want to have fun, you should go through the code of the standard codec, and that's actually um, hairy, tough, let's say it this way. And index reader on the other side just reads from, from the codec, and um, the codec decides how to decode the stuff that's written on disk. Um, for doc values, there is a doc values consumer, which consumes all the values, and there's a doc values producer, which does the decoding part. And what you need to do is you need to implement a doc values consumer and doc values producer if you want to do it. Um, specify the field to codec mapping, and then you're done. All right, so um, this little micro benchmark um, compared to uh, the field test loading for one field shows that uh, the implementation is slightly faster. Um, it's, it's, it really depends. If you, if you have a lot of fields, I didn't, I didn't bring up the, the, the results for, for, I had like 100 fields, some of them string values, some of them not. Um, it's actually even more. It's, it's much more than that. This is, um, in an average case, it's numeric fields decoded. Um, versus a float value and doc values. So it takes a lot of time, right? It takes a lot of disk discus has too. This one, the doc values, the most of the implementations simply read a byte array. They don't do anything else. It's all encoded into plain bytes. There's no encoding happening. 
um, it just sucks it in and it depends on, you know, it does one seek uh, on disk and then just one read with a given fixed length. So if you do real-time search and stuff like that, um, it, it can give you much better um, real-time open latencies here. I mean, eventually, every bit counts, right? I've been, I've been doing this talk before, and this slide has caused a lot of confusion. So in Lucene, what Solar calls a function query is a custom score query in Lucene. You see you have some kind of values you want to incorporate in the score, right? You put, take your query, put it in the custom score query, add your value source to it, and then run the query and it'll take the value, the float value from the value source and multiplies it into the score. What I've done here is I've just wanted to show that using doc values versus field cache has no impact on your performance. All these numbers like 2.9%, 6.5%, this, this is what I would consider in the noise. If you run it again, you'll have totally different ones, right? So it, it always depends. Um, some people last time were saying this benchmark might be biased because of uh, the JIT compiler might have inlined all the method calls. Actually, I only benchmarked one implementation, but I ran different implementations of them through the queries too. So I had all the, ben the doc values implementations um, in, my, in my benchmark, and I randomized the order too. So it shouldn't be biased by this, I hope. OK, so this is not a query benchmark. The query, th those queries, it doesn't tell you how fast those queries are. It just shows, OK, if you want to switch to doc values, you won't have a performance impact. OK, um, current state, I had to fix this this morning because I changed the API two days ago. Um, it's currently still in the branch, but um, I am very confident to commit it to Trunk either this week or next week. Um, there's two committers heavily working on it. Uh, it's me, Mike, and Candlis, and there's uh, hopefully Uber helping with the merch. Thanks. I will say it for you 60 days. Yeah, yeah, he will, he will, those commit mails are huge, we do all the merch. <laughs> that, that's why he's the, the most committing person, right? So if you do statistics over the machine source code, it's like Uwe who has been writing like millions of line of code because it's doing all the merges. <laughs> okay, um, the current features, I think I've talked about all of them. And... Um, well, more interesting is what's coming up. Thank you. I got it. <laughs> I got 15 minutes left, thank you. Um, what is next is I already worked on something that um, might change a lot of things in the scene. Dot values will eventually be updatable without re indexing. So currently in the scene, when you want to change a value in the term dictionary, um, maybe for all the fields, you have to re-index your entire code base. Right? With doc values, they won't be needed anymore. If you have something like PageRank or you have something like um, um, click feedback, that's why I use the examples in the beginning, which come every night, roughly. Right? It's something you want to incorporate into your scoring. You can do it with doc values without re-indexing. For big code bases, this, uh, for big um, document bases, this might be something um, which might, might change the whole process. Right? Uh, indexing, it depends. Um, we, I would say indexing 50 million documents can go really fast, 20 minutes, but it can also take six to seven hours. Right, Carl? Yes. yes. So um, six to seven hours is a long time. It always depends where the documents are coming from, what we have to do with them before, um, how, how data structure they are present and stuff like that. So if you, if you don't have to spend five or six hours or even longer, right, it's 50 million documents, a lot of people have way more, um, you gain much faster turnaround times. So you have uh, much better ranking um, eventually, or it's all coming in um, much quicker. I, I hope it's gonna solve like uh, 50% of the use cases where people want to update fields. A couple of problems um, here. We can't change values in a Lucene file. Uh, Lucene is entirely write once. 
we can only add files on top of this. Some of you might have, might have um, had the experience with too many open files. This will be a little bit risky if you have a lot of doc values fields because we have to write one file per document, uh, per, not per document, uh, <laughs> per field, per segment. So you have to be uh, kind of conservative with, with the feature um, that you don't have too many files. Um, we probably need to play a little bit with uh, index router settings and merge settings if it gets a problem, but um, we're also working on this to make this um, a little bit less files, putting it in compiled file system by default and stuff like that. <clears throat> Currently, um, when you update the norms value, which is used for scoring and length normalization, um, you, every time you update it in a live reader, it does a copy of the entire norms array, which is one by per document. Uh, this will go away with doc values. We're gonna we're gonna cut over norms to doc values too. It's gonna be a fixed length, um, straight written byte um, again. And some people are always complaining. Well, why is norms are um, an an eight bit floating value? If somebody wants to have thirty two, switch the implementation. That will be possible too now. Um, what we're gonna do is it's it's gonna be a stacked approach. So. It's actually pretty straightforward. So you have um, the source in, mem in memory and you want to update it, you're going to put it on a stack, right? It's some, some kind of uh, document ID value pairs. Um, there will be syntactic sugar on top of which is easy. Um, basically, um, when you're done with it, you commit it to disk. Um, the next time you read it in, it's going to be merged on the fly. You're going to have them um, right in, your, in, in the reader's memory. and. But you still have a point in time semantics for all your already open readers. So it won't change any existing memory. There won't be a reader which, which um, you open, you look up a document's value, look it up, look it up again, it will always be the same. Right? There's nothing changing there. But if you reopen it or you change it on a specific reader, these changes are reflected immediately. Um, once you have these, these, these stacks down on disk, Lucene will use either a, the normal merge process to put them together, or there will be a, um, a, a specified merge, merge process in the background which just merges those stacks together. Right, um, so a couple of use cases. I think I've talked about it, almost all of them. Um, frequently changing fields. If you don't need to search them, that's cool. If you need to search them, you need to wait until somebody implements um, partial field updates. I don't think it's going to happen soon. If it's going to happen at all. A lot of people talk about this. Um, um, updating index fields. It's a, it's a hard problem. Um, if somebody was really desperate and wanted to contribute, please patch us welcome. Right? All right. Um, I'm actually finished, but I'll have a lightning talk today. Um, where I have, it's only four slides and I might not talk at all, I just want to show you the pictures. But it shows you how we speed up indexing by 269% in uh, Lucene 4. Um, it's, it's a fun story, if you, if you want to be there, come in 420, um, I'll be at the lightning talk session. Alright, thanks. Yes, uh, the uh, byte array uh, or variable length byte array f for seeks, how fast is that? How do you actually handle that? That is the only exception which is not that fast at all. Oh, damn. <laughs> but um, there is a issue open which um, implements a skip list on top of this, and then you'll have lock n seek times, yeah. when these uh, fine things will be available in Zola. Oh, the, the question was, um, if I can give an estimate when these features will be available in Solar. I'm looking at my time. <laughs> uh, um, I think there's a good chance to have it with the Lucene 4 release also being in Solar. Um, it's, it needs to, we need to sort out a couple of things. You know, people need to decide ahead of time if they want to use stock values or um, 
or field cache for certain things. Um, there's also a couple of APIs that they, they directly call field cache, right? Um, I don't know too much about those solar internals. Um, well, you see, there's, there's a lot of stuff which needs to be changed, but I think there's a good chance that at least the feature is somehow reflected. Maybe not all the places, that every, everywhere where you can use field cache, you can also use stock values per configuration. But um, again, if you have a use case, you want to use it, um, you have some kind of integration, patches welcome, come up with it. Um, once, even once the scene 4 is out, we plan to have more frequent releases. It should be a scene 4 one once the scene 4 is out, which shouldn't take that much time. Um, we're counting on a community. Patches welcome. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, thank you. <laughs>